After Caesar crossed the Rubicon and marched on Rome, the Republicans retreated across the Adriatic Sea to northern Macedonia to gather their forces. Caesar, after a difficult winter crossings, finally succeeded in following them and was able to besiege them at Dyrrhachium. But disaster struck when his army unexpectedly routed and was nearly destroyed. Mutually exhausted, both armies struck out into the countryside, Caesar heading south, the Republicans east, and the two armies converged again at Pharsalus. The Battle of Pharsalus is said to have occurred not at Pharsalus itself, but at Palai Pharsalus, Greek for Old Pharsalus. The Barrington Atlas of the Ancient World places Palai Pharsalus on this peak here, but I think it was probably the larger one across the river. Regardless, Pompey probably placed his camp there, as he would have needed a one square mile area for 50,000 soldiers. Caesar's camp was somewhere in the plain below, probably near to Pharsalus itself, since the battle is named that. For an entire month, Pompey arrayed his troops only on the higher ground, not risking an open conflict on the flat plain. But finally, one day, Caesar noticed that he was actually down on the edge of the plain, and seizing the moment, Caesar prepared for battle. The entire morning, Caesar's army merely marched closer and closer to Pompey's stationary line, the Caesarians resting at intervals so as not to risk premature exhaustion. As Caesar approached, he studied Pompey's forces and formulated a plan. From his two battle lines, he drew off select cohorts into a third reserve line, and fewer still into a fourth reserve line, and he revealed to them his plan for how he thought the battle would go. A right flanking attack was what he wanted them to do, and he told them that the battle's outcome depended on their personal virtue. But off on Caesar's right was the might of Pompey's forces. There was vastly numerically superior cavalry, and behind them archers and slingers ready to unleash on Caesar's right flank or cavalry, whichever came within range. On the other side, the left, a sunken river, the Anipius, anchored Caesar's weaker flank, where the famous but depleted 9th and 10th legions were instructed to hold out for as long as they could. From 30 yards away, each side hurled their javelins, then turned to their swords and charged. At the extreme right, Caesar watched as Pompey's cavalry began budging backward and then finally slipping through the gap, circumventing and reverse enveloping Caesar's cavalry line. At this point, Caesar played his ace card, a trick he had learned from his enemies in Gaul. While the cavalry were blinded with dust, Caesar's third line infiltrated up behind them, slipped in amongst them, and began striking at the Pompeian youthful riders' faces with their long spears. The shock was so unexpected that the youthful Republican nobles turned and fled. Nor did they stop, but kept right on going up the nearest mountain, far outstripping any pursuers, permanently removing themselves from the battle. Having been prepped by Caesar, the third line then began Caesar's flanking plan, slaughtering the now unprotected bands of archers and slingers, and then smashing into the near rear corner of the Pompeian infantry. Caesar, however, knew that having broken through three Pompeian units, they would by now be exhausted and incapable of carrying on a prolonged fight. But for this problem, he had his fourth line, which followed behind them, and also smashed into the Pompeians in the rear, relieving the third line in the process. At this point, Pompey's whole army chain routed, and it began not with those surrounded and hard pressed, but from the other side, as the Pompeians over there realized that the battle was already being lost, that they had no response to Caesar's right enflankment where they had been strongest. Those who fled first headed for the most logical place, their camp. But that meant that they were cutting off the real hard-pressed troops behind them who therefore wouldn't be able to get through the camp's gates and therefore had to head for the rear elsewhere. The few who extracted themselves at the very back from the envelopment would have been forced towards the river where Caesar's cavalry was now arriving to begin chasing down and slaughtering the vulnerable crowds as always happens in all ancient battles. Caesar, however, 
had his army concentrate on the Pompeian camp, which, after driving the Thracian auxiliaries off the walls with masses of hurled projectiles, they were able to break into and take, thus sealing the Pompeians' fate by preventing them from being able to reform, and instead forcing the vast crowd to head for the next nearest mountain three miles away. A three-mile run, under attack, after the exhaustion of battle, is almost impossible in armor. So, as Pompey's army headed for the mountain, they discarded most of their standards, armor, and even weapons. This meant that a day later, when Caesar arrived and began besieging that mountain, he didn't need much protection or depth, as the Pompeians no longer had sufficient equipment to pose a serious sortie threat to his besiegers. At this point, the Pompeians took stock of their situation. The mountain had no water, and they wanted to get to Larissa, to which they knew their commanders had fled. Now, how would you get to Larissa from here? There were several huge mountain chains in the way. Would you head 10 miles straight across the open countryside, ready to be cut off by Caesar's infantry, then eaten up by Caesar's cavalry? Of course not. Would you instead head five miles a little to the right towards the shortcut pass? No, that too would be too dangerous. Nor, deprived of wagons, would you need the pass right beside it just because it was flatter and wider. No, you'd plan to head by the back roads, hugging the edge of the mountains all the way to so to have a place to flee to whenever attacked. The Pompeians undoubtedly took this last option and unexpectedly headed off into the distance. Caesar, taking just a few legions, eventually caught up with them, probably through the main pass here. Seeing his approach, the Pompeians would have probably fled to the nearest, tallest, steepest mountain. A mountain, Caesar said, whose foot is washed by a river and which has only one spring. Caesar laid siege to that mountain, and when he finally found out about the spring, seized it too, thus denying them water completely. At this point, what was left of the Pompeian army came down and surrendered. The Battle of Pharsalus was the first of the two great military defeats of the Roman Republic and began the undisputed but short reign of the first of the Roman emperors, Julius Caesar. Six years later, as a result of Caesar's assassination, the Republicans would lose again at the nearby Battle of Philippi, this time to Caesar's heir Octavian and Mark Antony, but that time permanently losing their military power forever. The ascendancy of the Roman Empire had begun.